So um, our church has been doing a series that the pastor has called Something More in 2024. And I wanted to pick up on that theme and build forward with that. Um, and so let's consider how we can do something practical, something <clears throat> in 2024. <clears throat> and um, and for the sake of the video, I'm gonna ask my friend Deb to push mute on her microphone, and then we're going to continue. <clears throat> So something more in 2024, will you step up to the wall? We'll come back to the theme of wall and then um, we'll pick up on that later. I'm gonna work on this, there we go. <clears throat> Thank you for your patience with me with the video. So when my brother does a, a business analysis, that's his job, he taught me to go in and say, what? What? Uh, I think it's what, what now and what next, I think. Uh, what, so what, and what next? There we go. Um, I, that's not my business, it's his. So I thought I would take an approach with that to this message. And this was specifically presented on Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. That's what S-O-H-L-S, -S, SOLD, stands for, Sanctity of Human Life Sunday. And it's a term that we in Christendom often pass around and throw around, but we don't ever really stop to think about what is it? What does that mean? <clears throat> um, Sanctity of Human Life Sunday was set up to observe when Roe versus Wade originally was set up, um, and that was on January 22nd. And so uh, Christendom has picked so uh, the, the Sunday closest to January 22nd to observe the Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, kind of a good way to get education out. I also picked that day, January 22nd, to start a crisis pregnancy center. And so it's always fun for me to talk on Sanctity of Human Life Sunday because it's also the birthday of our ministry. And this year we're celebrating 33 years, yay. And that's today I'm actually doing the video on that day. Um, and so let's unpack this phrase a little bit. What does sanctity mean? Sanctity uh, means the quality or condition of being sacred. Well, you know, it really bothers me when a definition includes a word that I don't understand. So I have to go look up a definition to understand that. Yeah, anyway, it's a chain. <clears throat> so what does sacred mean? And sacred means um, to be dedicated or set apart for the worship of a deity. So sanctity means to be set apart to worship a deity. In this case, our Lord, the Holy Spirit, the Father and the Son, the Trinity. And so we're worshiping God, the three in one. And, and that's what sanctity means. But let's take it apart a little further. I'm going to go out of order and jump down to the word life. I know that my God, the creator, <clears throat> created all things. He created the non-living things and the living things. And the cool thing about the word creation is it means to make something out of nothing. I, when I go make a cake, I get all my ingredients out and I line them up on the counter and I make something with those. But <clears throat> um, for, for this, God created this entire universe out of nothing. He's spoken into being. <clears throat> Included in that creation was life. He made life in plants, uh, the trees, the flowers, the grass, the grass that we had to mow every week. He made life in animals, the birds, the fish, the, the animals that creep on the ground. Um, yes, our puppies and our kittens. Sometimes you'll see my puppy pop in here. And he also made human life. And so... Let's jump back up to that word, <clears> the <throat> sanctity of human life. Human life is different from the other forms of life because the Bible says that in the creation process, God said, and he saw it was good. Every step of the way when he made something, he said he saw it was good. But then at the very end, after creating human life special, then he noticed he saw that it was very good. And so, um, What's different about human life? Well, the Bible says that God said, let us make man 
which is a, a broad term that's not gender related to refer to all of humankind. Let us make humans in our image. Now I'm a grammar freak and that kind of throws me off when it says image, one image, but us an hour. So let us make man in our image. Our is plural, but image is singular. And that shows us again, that amazing Trinity, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, three serving as one and as one God. And so I just love to take the scriptures apart detail by detail. So let's look here. God said, let us make man in our image. And he breathed life into the first man, Adam, and the, and the first woman, Eve. And I don't see that as legend or fable. I see that as truth. <clears throat> now, it's interesting because if he made man in his image and he sanctified human beings, we are set apart as God's image bearers to worship him as our deity. That is just so amazing. And so that's why we celebrate sanctity of human life. Yes, our puppies and our kittens and our sloths and anything else you happen to like are very precious, but human life is even extra special because e every single human is an air image bearer of God. Matter of fact, right now, stop and look at whoever's near you, the next person next to you, and look in that person's eyes and say, you are God's image bearer. You're an image bearer of God, and you are special and set apart to worship him. That's pretty special. Amazing. And that's the whole point behind Sanctity of Human Life Sunday, <clears throat> to remember that while all life is important, yes, we want to save the whales or save the trails, because it's God said, God said to bring dominion over the earth. We are to be wise stewards and take care of this world. But, but there's sanctity in human life because we are stamped with his image. We bear his image and we are to worship him as our creator. We have one little problem, and that is even with the overturning of Roe versus Wade, which was simply a law that federal mandate that all 50 states must provide abortions up until the day of delivery. And so that meant all nine months. And so Roe v. Wade didn't legalize abortion. It was a, a, a legal before, but it just took away any limitations. And the big stink now is whether or not the federal government, that's their role. Now, we're not going to get political with this, but let's look. Even with the overturning of Roe v. Wade, last year in Pennsylvania alone, from January to October, that's not counting November and December, 31,000 image bearers of God were snuffed out through abortion. One thing I need to say before I go any further, when I talk about this very sensitive issue, I realize that in a crowd of any size, even in our church congregation, there are individuals who have been touched by an abortion experience and have walked through that experience any of my comments I say are not meant to be hurtful to anybody who's been through an abortion experience. My comments are for education to the general public, to the church people, so that we can better understand this issue. And so I'm never, ever, ever making comments negative towards people who have been through it. Matter of fact, at our pregnancy center, we even offer Bible studies and discussion and the opportunity for healing and hope from the pain and the trauma of an abortion experience. And so I am not against people who have been through it, but I want to share the information to help other people understand the issues of a very touchy, emotional, volatile, political topic. <clears throat> now, my statistics that I shared there were taken from the Guttmacher Institute, which is the research arm of Planned Parenthood. And Planned Parenthood is one of the largest abortifiers out there. That's where they make their money. And so I did not go to some pro-life site to get skewered results or statistics. I went right to the source of the mouth. And that's, that's where I got that number of 31,000. So I just wanted to 
stop and think if we are sacred and set apart for the worship of a deity and we carry God's image, every single human being, then even those babies that are aborted are image bearers. You know, the thought about image bearers goes a long way. That includes the homeless. That includes the immigrants, whether they're legal or illegal. That includes <clears throat> the Israelis. That includes the Palestinians. Ooh. That includes your parents. That includes your children. That includes that person that you struggle to forgive. If we look at each human being in the eyes as an image bearer of God, it certainly helps us to process through a lot of the hurt and trauma in our lives. That's what. Now, so what? I was presented with information about abortion and that I should get involved in the situation. Uh, and I didn't know where to go or what to do. Uh, and at first, when my friend brought it up to me, I said to her, listen, my husband and I <laughs> are infertile and trying to have children. And if I hear a woman say the word abortion, I might choke her. So I don't think it would be good for me to get involved in anything in that area for right now. But later on, after the Lord filled our arms and our hearts and our home with two precious little gifts through adoption, and later he added a third, about six, seven years later, um, then God said, remember that you said that you didn't want to get involved because you had empty arms? Well, now your arms are full, so it's time to get involved. So I looked around to see what opportunities I had. Were there any pregnancy centers in our area, any place I could get involved? And you know what I found? No, there was nothing. And so I told God that because I just wanted to make sure he understood that there was nothing. And um, and guess what? He wasn't surprised. And he said, um, yes, I know that. But I want you to start something. And I kind of talked back to him. I said, listen, I just had major surgery and I have two babies and um, I'm a little busy and um, I, I'll, I'll talk to my husband that you gave me because he's my covering and my protection. And my husband, I went and told him what I heard from the Lord during my devotions way back in August of 1990. And my husband said, well, go for it. And I said, I think he read the wrong cue card, but we went for it. And so um, in January 22nd, 1991, 33 years ago today, um, my husband and I launched a crisis pregnancy ministry in our home. And it was there for a couple of years. And now it's, been, it's still going. There's a center downtown um, and it's run by a lot of people, not just me. And we'll get into more than that, more of that later. But that was the what and the so what. Now, the problem is when God invited me to get involved in his work, I'm pretty smart, but I didn't really understand what is abortion. I mean, I heard stuff. It's negative, moral, ethical. I didn't know. But I thought, let me see what God's word says about that. And I couldn't find the word abortion in this context anywhere in the scriptures. But I dug deeper and I said, what is going on? Where is this in the scriptures? And the Lord took me to many, many, many verses. And I picked out three just to show you, because my philosophy is if it's in the Bible once, it's important. If it's in the Bible three or more times, it's very important. So we better pay attention. And I saw in 2 Kings 8, 12, Hazael, this is in the middle of a conversation Hazael is speaking with a man of God, and it was a totally different context, but this is how the conversation uh, came about. Uh, in the middle of that, the man of God began to weep because he saw horrible things happening in the future. And so this man, Hazael, said, well, why does my Lord weep? And the man of God answered and said, because I know the evil that you will do to the sons of Israel. Their strongholds you will set on fire, and their young men you will kill with the sword. And their little ones you will dash to pieces. And their women with child, that's a biblical term for being pregnant, you will rip up. And that's just harsh. 
But stop and think of some of the reports we've heard coming from October 7th and think how close this is to that. But even more so, let's go on. Hosea 13, 16 says, the people of Samaria must bear their guilt because they have rebelled against their God. They will fall by the sword. Their little ones will be dashed to the ground and their pregnant women ripped open. And Amos 1, 13 says, this is what the Lord says. For three sins of Ammon, even for four, I will not relent because he ripped open the pregnant women of Gilead in order. And so we see this is a topic that is close to God's heart. It's not just mentioned, but it shows God's heart in, our, in, in response to that. Not hating the people who've been through this, but the people who propagate. He doesn't even hate. I can't even put it in that context. But just the... the the horrible aspects of the act itself. He has compassion on those. That's why he offers a way of forgiveness for all people, no matter what we've done. But in this case, we're focusing on this issue. Now I step back and said, okay, that's great. Now I know that there's abortion concepts in the scriptures, but what does it really mean? How does it fit in the big picture? And then the Lord showed me his heart. He said, you know, in John 10, 10, the Bible says the thief, which is technically Satan, comes only to steal, kill, and destroy. But I, Jesus Christ, have come that they might have life and have it to the full. We're not just talking about physical life. We're talking about emotional life and spiritual life. We're talking about the abundance of life. But we see here, right in this verse, is set up two sides, opposing sides, and they're in a struggle. And we see, we know, I read the end of the book, I know who the winner is. Yay, I'm, that's why I'm on Christ's team. But we see the intent of Satan, the thief, to kill, st kill, steal, and destroy. And then we go to Ephesians 6, and we see if our struggle is not against flesh and blood. I'm not against the human's that have had abortions. I'm not against the humans that have even performed abortions. It's the system that allows it. It's the government that propagates it. It's the policies and the laws. But even above the government and the policies and laws, there's a bigger struggle going on in the heavenly places. The scriptures say our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against authorities, against the powers of this dark world, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly realms. There's a battle in heaven, in the heavenly realms. And it is Satan who wants to kill and Jesus Christ who wants to give life. Mm. Furthermore, when I dug deeply, more deeply, I looked in the Old Testament in Exodus 13, and the Bible says you are to give over to the Lord the first offspring of every womb. The, then some scriptures say the one who opened the womb. And stop and think, how many abortions are first babies? Well, while we don't care and don't think about it, and not, Satan is saying, whatever God wants, <laughs> the firstborn, I want. I want to snatch it away from him. And I love to steal, kill, and destroy bloodthirstiness. This abortion of these firstborns satisfies Satan's bloodthirstiness. So now we're not talking about social issues. We're not talking about political issues. Now we're talking about a spiritual warfare and a spiritual enemy who is using humans as pawns whatever he has to do to get them to buy into his lies to get them to be duped and say oh i gotta have it it's my right it's my body anything to feed his bloodthirstiness mm. satan goes god wants it i get it and so we don't even realize that at times satan uses us as pawns just to get back at god whom he hates so we've taken this from a social issue and a political issue to a spiritual level issue that we never really have stopped to investigate and think about before. Wow, that is pretty big and pretty heavy. So 
as the Lord was taking me deeper into my newfound knowledge and I said, what to do? I said, what? So what? Well, what next? And he said, well, go ahead and start this. And I said, well, um, um, how do I start this? He took me to the book of Nehemiah. And if you've never read through it, I challenge you to read through it because the book of Nehemiah shows excellent leadership. Wow. And so keep this picture in mind. I'll have it in a small snippet on other slides, but Nehemiah. So Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king in a foreign country because Israel had rebelled. And once again, they were taken exile and taken to a foreign land for many, many years. But their heart was still at home in Jerusalem. And Nehemiah heard a report that his home in Jerusalem was in rubbles. The walls had been torn down. Things were destroyed. And he sat down and he wept. He heard of a contemporary problem. And his reaction was he wept. And then he prayed. Huh? How many of us sit down and pray first before we move ahead and do stuff? Ooh, good example. And then he was so humble, he confessed corporate sin. He didn't put himself up and say, those low life sinners over there, they done bad. He said, we have sinned against you, oh, holy God, forgive us. And so he identified with the people. He was humble enough and he confessed corporate sin. And Daniel also did that in, in Daniel chapter nine. So we need to use that as our model and ask God's favor. And then eventually it's a long story. I challenge you to read the book of Nehemiah. God opened up the way for Nehemiah to be able to travel back to Israel to the city of Jerusalem. <clears throat> and then God, he got there and he rode around the city and he saw the immense amount of work that needed to be done. And he thought, what am I going to do? So God gave him specific instructions. And if you look in, in the Bible, in Nehemiah, God said, listen, look at the whole wall. Here's a section, here's a section, here's a section. Tell this group of people to work at this section. Tell this group of the people. And he used the word then and next and after and after that. So he had people covering every section of the wall around the city. It was an immense task. They had enemies come in and mock them and make fun of them, saying, you're never going to get this done. But if you look at the fine print on that visual or that graphic I said, they, the, the a whole project was accomplished in 52 days. Now, in my mind, I'm not good with numbers, but that's less than, what, two months? What? <laughs> a huge amount of work because he delegated workers to each section of the wall. And then the key verse came up in, uh, in Nehemiah 2.18, the last part B. They said, let us arise and build. So they put their hands to the good work. So I wanted to model after this and I prayed and I asked God to lead the way. And he showed me each section of the ministry that needed to be, de be developed. But he said, don't do all of it. You work on this section and I will bring other workers in to the other sections of the wall. And over the last 33 years, that is exactly what he has been doing. It could be overwhelming, but I saw God's plan. So my response then was to seek, pray and seek God's face, to seek my husband's counsel. I had to be open and teachable. This is an area, like, what do I know about pregnancy? Like, I was never going to give birth to a child. God blessed us with three children through adoption, but a, a pregnancy is nothing I had ever experienced. Isn't it interesting that God picked my weakest area and asked me to serve there? Because when we are weak, he is strong. And if we allow him to work through our weaknesses instead of being angry and bitter and yield that to him, he can bring something beautiful out of it. It's amazing. So I allowed him to work in my weakest area and I trusted him to bring all the workers to this every section of the wall. And it's been an amazing um, thing to watch how he has worked. One of the first sections of the wall that needed to be done, I started seeing clients in my home, but that was a small one-on-one -on -one thing. I knew I needed to have a corporation. I knew I needed to get a 501c3. I knew I needed to have documents to have a corporation like mission statement and purpose statement. And it was overwhelming. I had people from the community come to me and say, we hear what you're doing. We were planning on starting something, but you've already gotten it done. 
can we come along beside you and help this to grow? And I'm like, been waiting for you, thanks. Because God had told me he would bring the workers. And so one of the first sections of the wall, he built a board and the board developed the mission statement and the board got the 501c3 and the board got the incorporation, not necessarily in that order. It was amazing. It was done in record time. We had lawyers telling us it's going to take a year or six months. Well, nope. Boom. It was done. Our mission statement that the first board developed is your loving choice as a Christian ministry. That means we serve in the name of Christ. It doesn't require all of our clients to be Christians. We love any image bearer that walks through that door. Promoting life as given by God, from God. Offering loving support to those facing unplanned pregnancies. Providing education about the life-giving options of adoption and parenting. And conveying God's healing to those traumatized by abortion. And advocating sexual integrity as the only true prevention of sexual crisis. So God built this organization for the last 33 years on these standards that I believe come straight from his heart. I wanna tell a couple stories of how, th how God has used the ministry to impact people. Um, my first client back in 1991 hitchhiked from New York City all the way to Bloomsburg. <laughs> what, here in Pennsylvania, uh-huh. And she was coming off crack, the drug, and out of what she thought then was a lifestyle of prostitution, but she has now come to realize that she was part of trafficking. She was trafficked as a very young girl. Um, and I was able to be with her in the delivery room when she had her baby. And it was a beautiful thing. And she now owns a piece of my heart. And she's now an amazing young woman who is serving others as a professional counselor in another state. Just amazing to see how God has worked through this, even through continuing. We're still in contact after 33 years. Um, another story I'd like to show you, it's not one specific client, but it's how it's touching lives, is this past year, our newest director, her name is Marth. She's a beautiful woman, I love the Lord. And she said, we need to have more contact with the students on campus. How can we reach them? Well, God has grown the ministry and now it offers free uh, testing for sexually transmitted diseases and follow-up for that. So she said, we need to get the word out. So she gathered some volunteers and put together some gift packs with uh, items that college students would like and went in during registration day and on campus on the big green, just stood there and handed out gift packages. And in no time whatsoever, 529 gift packs were gone. And the students loved it. And we have seen an increase in client flow, especially for STD testing since that event. She would like to, uh, she has a dream, a goal of, of distributing maybe between 1,500 and 2,000 for next year. And that's a specific ministry <clears throat> that's available if anybody wants to help there, either financially or by volunteer time. Um, another story I'd like to share is in the last few years, we were able to add free ultrasounds, limited obstetric ultrasounds to our services. So girls who are pregnant, women who are pregnant can come in and have free ultrasounds uh, for a certain length during their pregnancy. <laughs> the very first client that we had come into the office and we tried out our ultrasound equipment and all of the work that went in behind it um, was considering having an abortion. And when she saw her baby moving on that screen, she said, oh my, oh my, I, I must have this baby. I must give birth to this baby. And so just that very, very first experience with our new um, service touched lives, changed lives. And that's the kind of work that God has done through the ministry by bringing workers to the wall. We needed to have ultrasound people. We needed to have a medical director a doctor who was on call to look at all of our scans. I mean, it's just been amazing how he has brought workers to each section of the wall over the years. And so I just wanted to share, this is a quick picture of the front of our building here in the center of Bloomsburg. And um, it's our 33rd anniversary. So anybody who lives locally to this is welcome to come in and have a tour and um, maybe to see if there's a section of the wall that you could work. Well, I don't know. 
So my challenge to you is, are you willing to allow God to work in you to do something more in 2024? There are still open sections of the wall at Your Loving Choices. On June 1st, 2024, we'll have one of our major fundraisers, the Walkathon. Come and walk. And if you can walk, great. And then you would get pledges and sponsors as you walk and earn money and raise the money to help forth our fundraiser. Uh, some of people like my friends here watching on this video have been sponsors for us for years and years and years for the walkathon. And that's an important role too. Um, uh, in October, on the, October 24th, we'll be having our annual banquet. Those of you who are local, we need table hosts. And you invite your friends who don't know very much about this ministry, your loving choices, to come here a dynamic speaker and then be prepared to give a love offering. That's another one of our major fundraisers. We need volunteers to be coaches. We used to call these counselors, but we're not professional counselors. So we would prefer to call ourselves coaches and we offer free training. These are the people who work directly with the clients. Um, we also need, if you know anybody local that's pregnant, and doesn't, isn't in a crisis pregnancy, but is willing to come in and get a free ultrasound to help our ultrasound technicians keep their certi certifications active. That's a great way to volunteer and not be in a crisis, but be able to use your pregnant scenario as a way to help build God's ministry. It's amazing. We always need office volunteers. We also sometimes have part-time employment. And right now, we are in need of a part-time development coordinator, and that is with pay. Um, that's another section of the wall that needs to be filled. We always need board members. We need people to pray. We need people to give. We need time, treasure, and talent. So are you willing to step up to a section of the wall here? Do you have a pregnancy center in your area that you could step up to a section of the wall there? Uh, other ministries like Agape here in town, they need workers at their sections of the wall. The other thing that maybe God wants to do something more for you in 2024 is through your local church. In our case, Community Alliance Church, that's what CAC stands for. We need youth workers. Our youth group has been on hold for a while. We have precious, precious teens that need to know that their local church loves them and wants to pour into them. And so we need youth workers. We can always use children's workers for our children's church and our nursery. Um, we have a lot of workers for Awana, but we're few on children. So you people who are local to the Bloomsburg area and you have children in your neighborhood, invite them to come to our Awana program on Monday nights. It's free. It's wonderful. We could always use workers on the worship team. We do need people who know the word or are willing to grow to disciple new believers. We've been having many People come to know the Lord recently, and we need to disciple those new believers. We also need people to cook and make meals to be able to take out when people in the church or community that we're aware of are sick and need meals to come and pray and give, again, time, treasure, and talent. So whether it's in your home community, if you're at a distance, or whether it's in a home church in your area, or whether it's here at Loving Choices or at Community Alliance, are you going to say something more in 2024? Lord, Lord, show me where I can step up to the wall. So my challenge to you is what is your response? Where is your section of the wall? You can't really begin to serve the Holy One, the King of Kings, if you're not yet in a relationship. So perhaps you want to step up first to Jesus Christ and say, I need you in my life. I need you to forgive me of my sins. I need you to cleanse me and make me new and then to show me how you can use me to serve in your kingdom. For those of you already walking with Christ, will you step up to the wall at Loving Choices? Will you step up to the wall at Community Alliance? Will you step up to the, wall, to the wall at a ministry in your local area or a local church in your local area? What is your loving choice? How are you going to allow God to work in you to do something more in 2024.